we have Christine that we have Christina and Nick answering for us. So I have a little brief bio for each of them. So I wanted to introduce you to Nick Dooley, who's actually a new member with North Shore HR. And North Shore HR Consulting is a full service human resource consulting company based out of, oh, go, I should have paid, <laughs> no, go walk. Do you want to say that for me, Nick? Uh, no, go watch me, um, Peterborough. Thank you. And that's I, I great. I'm really the, 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 the local, uh, the, 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 the indigenous uh, affiliation uh, location. Really appreciate that you are doing that. That's a fantastic. So he's president lead consultant. Nick Dooley brings more than 25 years of human resources, consulting and leadership experience to support small to medium sized companies across the GTA in Eastern Ontario with insightful and practical HR advice, guidance and training. Additionally, Nick and his associates provide neutral third-party workplace investigations services into allegations of workplace harassment, sexual harassment, and human rights-based investigations. Nick has been a member of the HRPA uh, since 1998 and is a certified human resources leader. He's also a member in good standing of the Canadian chapter of the Association of Workplace Investigators, holds an honors bachelor of science in psychology, as well as certificates in human resource management and advanced te investigation techniques. I also have Christina Wallace, who is a member of our board and joined the chamber a couple of years ago when she returned. As a senior lawyer, she re recently returned to her hometown of Belleville to continue her practice of law. She practices litigation and employment law has a vast experience in the area of employment law from drafting agreements and policies to litigating employment disputes and terminations, including human rights issues. So as a disclaimer, cause she's a lawyer and we all appreciate this. Um, Christina is with us today to provide general legal information concerning employment issues and not specific legal advice. Should you require legal advice for your specific situation, you should retain a lawyer. So I really want to thank you both for coming. Uh, if you want to unmike and or unmute and just say hello, and then we'll start getting into some of the questions. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Looking forward to uh, to a fulsome discussion about these topics. Good morning, and I'm also pleased to be here and uh, looking forward to uh, exploring this back to work process. So we. With the engagement of this particular session, we had received an email actually from somebody who was interested in pursuing what we would almost consider headline type comments. And certainly we would expect that with, with social media and how people are gathering information, there are two sides to everything and people will kind of armchair lawyer their way through some ideas or their expectations or what they think might be correct. So we took those four questions and thought we would start there. Certainly we'd invite you all to put, uh, if you have a, a more specific question, throw that in the Q&A please. Between Lisa and I will monitor that. And uh, we'll start with those four questions that we kind of teased you with. So the first, question that we asked was what COVID protection still needs to be in place as we start to reopen and we see retail opening and salons and everything else. Do you want to start Nick or? Yeah, sure, sure, I, I will. Uh, thanks, Christina. So um, I, I, have, um, I have a bit of a disclaimer myself and my disclaimer is I'm, I'm an HR professional. I, I am not a lawyer. Uh, so, so um, um, I'll refer the, uh, the really heavy hitting questions to, uh, to, to Christina. Um, but with regards to uh, COVID protection that, that still needs to be in place, um, as a reminder, you know, the Occupational Health and Safety Act uh, is still in effect. And, and as employers, you, you have a, a duty to protect your, your employees from work-related injury and illnesses. And so with respect to, um, uh, to COVID protection, you're still required to take all reasonable protections. Uh, you're, you're required to communicate uh, workplace hazards and you're required to train employees on, on how to deal with those hazards. Um, and that's, that's where these, these requirements flow from. Uh, specifically, uh, the government and um, your, your public health uh, unit have, uh, uh, have arranged for, uh, are required that you are to arrange for 
um, COVID-19 safety plans. Um, they're been in place for quite some time now. They're easy to access online, uh, a template for developing them. Um, that will help you to, to, to mitigate the risk of, of any transmission within your workplace or in, into and, and within your, your workplace. Um, you need to make sure that these are, are still in place. Um, you need to make sure that they're posted, that they're available upon request. Uh, and, you know, not having these things could, could result in something nasty, such as a, an order to close. Um, it's a really good idea at this point uh, to uh, reassess your safety plan uh, on a regular basis. And, and certainly with the uh, reopening looming uh, uh, scant couple of days from now, uh, this is, this is you know, uh, I'd say one, one of the best opportunities to, to reassess uh, any plans that you actually have in place. Um, see what's changed within that plan. Um, see what, um, make sure that your employees are aware of that plan, that uh, you're anyone who may also be entering your workplace, such as you know, customers, suppliers, contractors, uh, delivery persons, that sort of thing. Uh, make sure that they are uh, aware of your, your safety plan, uh, that it exists. Talk to your, your safety people within your workplace. Make sure that your, your safety plans are, um, are up to date. Um, look for things such as, um, you know, work uh, equipment, machinery that may not have started for uh, a period of time, make sure that that's uh, all inspected and ready to go. Um, make sure that um, your, um, uh, sorry, I'm just going screen here. Um, make sure that um, anything that you can do to support your employees, you're, you're able to do. So recognize that uh, in many cases, uh, and we'll probably touch on this later, um, there's, there's a certain mental health, uh, uh, there, there's a number of mental health implications that uh, your, your employees may, uh, may be facing as they return to work post-COVID. Uh, post um, and prepare yourself as best you can for these, um, these issues, mental health issues, and um, uh, anything related to the anxiety of returning to work or the anxiety of you know, being part of a, a post-COVID uh, uh, environment. Um, I think I'm going to... Pause there, Christina. Sure, so uh, I agree with everything Nick said. Um, so the workplace control measures that the public health units have uh, issued, including the masks, wearing, um, physical distancing, uh, sanitizing, et cetera, that all remains in place. That doesn't go away just uh, because we're reopening or because people are being vaccinated. Uh, the, you know, the government uh, clearly states that workplace control measures reduce the chance of being exposed to the virus. And they also state that the vaccinations reduce the chance that you will get sick. So it really doesn't change our measures that we're currently using. They still are all in place and need to be part of your uh, safety plan under the Occupational Health and Safety Act that everyone's required to have. Um, that's probably all I have to add about, because uh, the question is about what protections remain in place. They, they all do. Uh, vaccinations aren't changing this. We're going to get more into vaccinations in these discussions today, but nothing really changes as far as what uh, Right. And I, I presume that everybody has a safety plan. I know that we've posted the templates and the links to that in um, on our COVID-19 page on our website. So if anybody hasn't found one or hasn't created one, there is a template there. And when you're developing that, I think what the key point is to kind of imagine what an adverse event might look like. In what situation could somebody come into close contact with somebody, in what situation might put them at risk. And any advice on developing those safety plans or maybe more specifically what we could do around considerations now? I'd like to see, um, I'd like to see employers, again, consulting with uh, their, their constituent employee groups, their, their, their health and safety reps, their, their joint health and safety committee members, you know, the union if there is one. Um, Get your data from as many sources as possible. Uh, make sure that, um, uh, that, that, uh, that 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 you've considered all, all the, the, the different uh, different uh, options. Do you know do a do a proper risk assessment of uh, of where the real risk lies and and uh, what kind of controls 
uh, you can put in place to, 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 to mitigate those. And, and again, there's the, the, the public health guidance involves a, a hierarchy of, of controls. And, and the first one is, uh, is, is elimination, uh, you know, all the way down to, uh, to personal protective equipment. And there's a number of different ways to, 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 to prevent uh, the transmission and, and elimination. Preventing it from getting into the workplace in the first place is, is obviously the most preferable one. Sure. The um, one piece there, one of the things that we've certainly heard about workplace transmission is that it doesn't tend to happen when people are working, working, but when they gather for lunch or they gather for a meeting or they're at the coffee, the water cooler, the coffee maker in the cafeteria outside in the smoking area. Those are those spaces that probably really need to be considered in your safety plans as well. Um, so. Sorry, I'll just jump in just in for, for a quick sec. So um, a, a, good, a good communication plan between an employer and, uh, and their employees would, uh, would address some of those issues. So I, I would say, you know, make sure that uh, you have, you know, a, a policy or at least a, you know, a set of expectations that you communicate to your employees, uh, which describe, you know, how you expect them to, to engage with, uh, with each other or, you know, or not. Uh, for that matter, uh, in, in the lunchroom and break areas, you know, uh, things such as, you know, masks must be worn at all times, uh, yeah, unless you're actually eating uh, as much as possible. We prefer that you take your breaks outside, you know, trying to trying to stagger or schedule uh, the actual break times, uh, that sort of thing. But again, communication is, 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 is paramount. Right. The other thing that has been a big deal in the last few weeks is the rapid antigen testing. And we've been doing the test kits here. And I think one of the pieces that we hear from employers who want to implement that system is that they're thinking that they can do that as a precautionary as opposed to a consistent procedure. So it's, it's the fourth thing that you do and you do a consistent, it's like the consistent screen. So every two or three days you have all of your employees do this. It's not meant to replace the health screening survey that you have to do. It's not meant to replace the idea that if you're not feeling well, you should stay at home. It's not meant to replace the idea if you've been told to self-isolate and you just don't feel bad, that you can come to work. So that, but we do have a lot of, we do have kits. We have about 13 employers who are actually using them now. And the goal is to prevent the transmission from that third of people, that 30% of people who never have symptoms and have no reason to expect that they might have COVID. So um, just, I'll, I'll put that plug in that we are doing that if that is an additional protocol that you wanna put in place, but it doesn't replace anything that's already there. And it's voluntary. I think Christina, you really mentioned that that has to be a big part of it. That's correct. So, you can't require your employee to take these tests. Right. And that brings us to the next question, which is, can an employer insist on vaccination before a return to work? And I'll throw that to you right now, right away, Christina. Okay. So it's a, it's a very, very hot topic. Um, it has a lot of uh, different complications to it. Generally, uh, vaccination is a medical procedure and uh, it's a private affair. So we, we intersect between privacy laws, uh, safety plans under the Ontario Occupational Health and Safety Act, as well as human rights issues. So under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, uh, employers are required to take, quote, every precaution reasonable in the circumstances. That's a very broad uh, definition of what employers are required to do. It's probably purposely meant to be broad so that it can address issues such as this that are probably not wholly anticipated when the legislation is drafting. Having said that, reasonableness is, is the key factor in that. And so far, uh, you'll see that certain vaccinations are mandatory, more in the unionized setting uh, with respect to healthcare workers, uh, daycares, education systems. It hasn't really ever been into the private industries and that's what is being discussed now. Can you back, 
require mandatory vaccinations in other industries. There's nothing uh, to support that. Uh, it, it remains to be seen. The government, uh, different levels of government have uh, come out and basically and said that they have no plans to ma make vaccinations mandatory. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. And I, I think it's important to understand the reasoning behind that. Uh, the federal, provincial, and the territorial commissioners on privacy have clearly stated that currently there's no evidence presented that vaccines are effective in preventing transmission. And the government's websites say that the vaccinations reduce the chance of you becoming severely sick. They do not prevent transmission. So even if you're vaccinated, it doesn't mean that you can't get COVID or transmit it. So until that scientific data comes that supports that vaccinations prevent transmission, we are in the state of the government's not willing to take any kind of step to make vaccinations mandatory in the workplace. But balanced against that, and what the general wording is under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, you can do what's reasonable in the circumstances. So if you could justify that your workplace or a section of your workplace, depending on its activity, that it would be reasonable to require vaccinations, you may be able to make it mandatory, but it's, it's still a, a very touchy legal issue as to whether that could be challenged. You would have to demonstrate that it is reasonable, that the risk factor is there, and you would have to have a clear policy that would set out the purpose of why you're mandate, mandating vaccinations and what will happen if a person's not vaccinated, how will you address that? And, and that's a whole other issue altogether as to the reason why someone is not or whether they even have to disclose the reason why not. Uh, if there is a mandatory vaccination policy uh, as far as privacy, you would have to have the consent of people to collect information with respect to vaccinations. You have to have clear unequivocal consent. And you would have to have a method of how you are uh, collecting that information, how you are storing it, and how you're disposing of that information. As far as the rights legislation goes, uh, refusing to get a vaccination and relying on a human rights, uh, uh, grounds under the human rights for refusing, would likely be under the grounds of a disability or pregnancy or religion. But those are very tight grounds and probably difficult to come under. You can't uh, basically just say I'm against vaccinations or I, I, I don't have a reason other than I don't agree with them or I'm, you know, I'm an anti-vaxxer as a reason uh, to rely on the human rights uh, grounds to support that. Uh, so it, it, it is a, it's a very difficult area. I, we have no guidance from the government or the public health units as to uh, vaccination policies or mandatory vaccinations or their, or their standing on it really. Uh, so it, it's a really open area and you need to tread very carefully. Well, it's interesting because it's not like we haven't been vaccinated for years. We just don't remember when we had to have them, like it wasn't new. So we probably all, I still have my, I mean, I have the smallpox scar. I mean, and I mean, not everybody has those, but polio, diphtheria, um, your MMR. If we, and we, if we have children, we kind of are familiar with going through that process. But it, with the exception of school-age children who are checked and they can make some kind of case for not doing that, 
kind of, it's automatically assumed that you would. So this is interesting because it brings into context this new fear. Anyway, I'm going to pass it over. Nick, do you have anything to add? Yeah, it's um, it's such a such an interesting uh, intersection between between health and safety and, and, and human rights. It's it's just just fascinating what's 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 happening because you know so there's there's good arguments on 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 both sides and you know full disclosure I've, I've had my first vaccine anyways I'm I'm on one side of this issue but um, with regards to um, uh, you know the mandating it for for your your employees um, in, individuals have have an agency over their own body so. You have you have a choice of you know what what kind of medical uh, procedures or, or, um, or basically what you, what you do with your body and that's that's a that's a uh, that's that's a key part of uh, of, of human rights and and uh, so you know by by choosing to mandate um, you know consequences potentially for employees that uh, that that don't have a, a vaccine you're potentially setting up a situation where there could be an argument. Uh, made against you that you have uh, some kind of differential treatment for, um, you know, bodies of employees who who have um, have received uh, uh, the, the vaccine and those who haven't, um, and um, you know these employees, uh, you know, as Christina mentioned, they could be, um, you know, in many cases, uh, presumably making a um, a legitimate, uh, 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 you know, a genuine um, assertion that their their human rights uh, uh, are being impinged upon. Um, with respect to to, to religious uh, objections or you know a, a medical condition or disability for that matter, uh, and so you may be perceived to be you know discriminating against them, and that's that's not a situation you want to be a, as an employer where you have to defend yourself against uh, something like that. Well, it goes so, further. Uh, it, it goes further as far as human rights go. So, say uh, you have. You're asking uh, employees whether they've been vaccinated or not, and the ones that haven't been vaccinated are maybe being shamed by other employees, which could be a human rights problem. You could be differentiating between them as far as okay, vaccinated people can go to these conferences, but a non-vaccinated cannot. That may affect their promotions. That may affect their monetary pay, um, and then you're getting into are you differentiating people based on that? And that's a human rights issue. So it, it, it can be a problem and it needs to be controlled in the workspace. And that's why policies may be very important because uh, the employer can set the tone through policies as to whether they are doing these things and what it means. And make sure that the policy addresses issues surrounding vaccinated people and non-vaccinated so that the employees are clear on what's expected of them. And I think that's what's really important with these policies is the education of the employees. And it shouldn't be the employers making up the education program, but referring the employees to sources that are scientific, et cetera and educating the uh, people and addressing the fears that are there and how they're going to deal with those issues such as I just mentioned, um, how they're going to deal with going forward, uh, how the workspace will look and what the consequences would be if somebody violates the policies, that's going to be important as well. And know that if the policies are violated, there may be good reason that an employee has for violating the policy. And it's really gonna to have to be assessed on a case by case basis. You need to learn whether there is maybe a disability there or some form of human protected human rights issue that needs to be looked at and whether it needs to be accommodated. I think what's That's interesting right. here is Sorry, as you as you talk, and I'll, I'll give you two seconds, um, that when you talk about the vaccination and the scientific basis right now, that it doesn't prevent the transmission, that that, that should provide your employer with some sense of comfort that you can communicate this to the rest of your staff, that vaccination isn't required because it's not seen as a definitive defense against. So all of the other safety protocol that you're keeping in place is really meant to keep your staff safe. 
and vaccination may not be the end game. So it doesn't have to be that kind of criteria. Is that fair? Yes, with the data we know at present. I mean, that could change, but sure. right now it, it's, it's quite clear if you go to any authority that that is the state of affairs at the moment. So I have another yours. question. Do you have anything else to add to that, Nick? Yeah, uh, sorry, just to jump off there, Jill. So essentially, there's there's any number of other, you know, far less intrusive um, options to protecting your workforce uh, uh, instead of uh, requiring them to, to to actually put something in their body. Um, so we're talking about things like just the basics, the, the screening, you know, pre pre workplace uh, screening, uh, PPE, social distancing, proper sanitizing protocols, and, and that sort of thing. Now, the other thing we have is people who are working from home. I mean, that's the safest place to be, isn't it? Absolutely. And then, but now you have some employees who really enjoyed being able to do that, but do they have a case to continue to do so if you want them to come back? And are there any best practices to handle that situation? Well, maybe I'll talk from a legal aspect. So it would depend on the employment contract. If there's an employment contract, uh, that's going to rule as to what the employee employer's rights are with respect to remote working. But absent that, um, an employer generally has the right to require an employee to be physically present in the workplace. Uh, if that employee though, and it would be on a case-by-case -case basis, has some reason, a legitimate reason, such as a, some form of disability or childcare needs, um, there can be various reasons, that needs to be explored by the employer. They can't just say, I'm calling you back into work, you need to attend on Monday. Uh, and the employee says, no, I've got a problem. They need to explore that problem and see if it is a legitimate reason not to return to the workplace. Under those circumstances, the employer is uh, permitted to obtain documentation or proof that this condition really exists if they can't return to work. From there, the employer would look at it to see how they could accommodate that situation. And it's truly up to the employer how they accommodate. It's not the employee's choice. So the employee can't say, look, I just proved a disability. I want to work from home. That's how I want to work. Uh, it's not the employee's choice. It's not even the doctor's choice. It's the employer's. And it's something employees often don't understand. It's the employer that has to find the suitable accommodation for that employee. It may be working from home but it is the employer's choice. Nick? And, yeah, and, and even with regard to, uh, to, to, to working from home, there, there may be further uh, accommodations uh, necessary. For example, um, you know, maybe that, that, that employee is not able to you know, sit at that workstation, uh, which is now their kitchen table or, or whatever it might be, uh, from 8.30 to 4.30. Maybe they require regular breaks and um, you know, while school is on, certainly, you know, when you might need to supervise their, uh, their children, um, if they, assuming they have some, or, you know, elderly parents for that matter, uh, elder care is, is certainly a, uh, a hot spot these days. Um, they may need to work, uh, uh, you know, uh, different hours and, and uh, a slightly different schedule. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll put this to, uh, to, to our group as well. You know, what's, what's wrong with, with offering some flexibility to your, to, to your workplace? What's, what's wrong with considering um, you know, whether, whether your, your, your staff could possibly, you know, gain an increase in their, their, their work-life balance by working from home, you know, one or two or maybe three days a week. Um, you know, there, it's a, this is a really good opportunity to look at your, your work practices, your workflow, your, your meeting, your communication uh, networks, and, and see if there's, there's not some in-between which might make your employees a little bit, uh, a little bit happier and, and presumably more, more productive. Um, a couple other things to think of as well as a, uh, as employees uh, return to work, or as you're considering having your employees return to work, um, policies. So make sure that your policies are up to date, your work from home policies, your uh, overtime policies, your, your, your IT, your, your data security policy, these, these things all need to be addressed if, if you haven't already. Um, if you are gonna be keeping your employees at home permanently maybe, um, you need to consider the tax implications of, of doing so and, and <clears throat> consider whether there's uh, 
any way that you want to to assist with with the cost of maintaining this uh, this data and this technology that you're requiring your, your employees to access during the workday. Um, and uh, I, I mentioned earlier uh, in this as well, um, you need to, as you're considering um, having your employees returning, uh, returning to work from home, potentially at, at a workplace of, uh, of your choosing, um, you, you do need to keep aware and be prepared for possible mental health uh, implications. Um, there, a number of employees may express some anxiety about coming back to a workplace, which is, you know, um, although you have all, you've done your best to, to maintain controls and, and to prepare for, for to communicate for these uh, uh, these measures that you're taking, they may feel genuinely upset about um, uh, being in a, in a workplace environment where there's other people. Uh, not to mention, you know, how, how they actually get there in the in the first place, uh, public transit or or uh, anything like that may may, may be uh, an anxiety uh, uh, written uh, consideration as well. And so we just need to, 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 to prepare for the fact that, you know, this, this pandemic may have brought upon, you know, mental health issues to, uh, to employees and, and, and to families. So, uh, and it may have actually made them worse uh, if they were pre-existing. So, you know, do your best to, to, to prepare for that. And, and as they come forward uh, to address them in, in, a, in an appropriate manner, consider, you know, as Christina mentioned, the accommodation process, the conversations, the discussions uh, with them, uh, which are aimed to, to, to help them reintegrate uh, in a positive manner. We do have a question from the chat as you're talking about policies and they are asking what the policies look like when you're hiring new employees. So do you want to tackle that one? Oh, let me comment on that first because um, workplace policies really need to be uh, adopted by the employees. So you can't just put out policies all of a sudden and say, here, this is our new policies. Uh, because it's not far, it doesn't form part of the employment contract. Technically, it doesn't form part of the employment contract, whether that contract be a letter or a formal agreement or even verbal, unless that policy is provided prior to the employee starting work on their first day. If you want to implement policies uh, to existing employees, you need to provide something to those employees in exchange. It's a new contract, so they need something, a new incentive, a new what we call consideration in contract law uh, to those employees, and they got to sign on to it. And you can't force them to. Uh, so often what happens with existing employees and you want to roll out you know, what are significant new policies is you roll that out and you give the, uh, the employees something that they would not ordinarily get. So you can't just do it at raise time, say here's your new policy and here's your raise. You have to give something, um, you know, even a hundred dollar gift certificate or an extra vacation day, something more than they ordinarily get in exchange for them agreeing to the new policy. Uh, I think the question is what, when you're hiring new pol um, employees. So, if you do establish these new policies, uh, you can roll them out with the existing employees like I just discussed. And when you're hiring new ones, just make sure that the, you are giving these policies to the employees prior to them starting on their first day. And if you, if you have employment contracts, uh, you should refer to the employment policies in that contract and have the employee acknowledge that they've received it prior to them starting work. And the only thing I'm, I, I would add to that is, is if the question contemplates more of, um, you know, what what you would put in an employment contract with relation to uh, uh, to vaccination, um, and maybe I'm, I'm extending that a little bit. Um, but if if that's a situation, then um, that that would potentially be very fraught uh, topic. You, you'd want to make sure that it's done for uh, for the right reasons, for legitimate reasons, uh, and I would strongly suggest that you speak with. Uh, with an employment lawyer such as Christina, as you're as you're making those uh, uh, those kinds of determinations, uh, it is possible, but you have to make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons under the right circumstances. Right. Thank you. Um, there's another piece that uh, is there a liability risk against a business if transmission happens as a result of an unvaccinated employee, and that I think that's a really interesting question because. In theory, if all of the other protocol are in place, 
is that really you just have to prove that you did that or how does that work? Right, so as long as an employer is following all the uh, requirements of the public health units that they're advising that you should do, uh, as we already discussed, you can't mandate vaccinations generally in the workplace unless you are in a specific situation that it would be reasonable. Um, so, I'm sorry, I forgot the question. <laughs> Sorry, the transmission. What's the liability risk to a business? So if you have, so on the other hand, if you did mandate vaccinations in the workplace and you had a policy to that effect, you then become liable for employees who choose not to. But recently the Workplace um, Safety Board has decided that they will give coverage to that type of issue. So it's kind of interesting, and I think that's fairly recent, that if it is a requirement in your workplace that you be vaccinated and you have adverse reactions to the vaccination, that you would be covered under the workplace safety insurance. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, as, as these things expand, we're going to see changes such as that. Uh, so other than that, um, an employer generally wouldn't be liable because it is a personal decision whether you get vaccinated or not. But the tricky part is if they start mandating, if the employer mandates vaccinations. And, and your best defense is always due diligence and, and, and process. So if you, if you have established safety plans, which you've you know, downloaded from the Ontario government or, or from, the, uh, from the chamber, of course, uh, and you've, you've worked with your health unit to complete them and uh, they've been you know, consistently enforced and you can point to the, 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 the physical uh, uh, methods that you've taken to communication with your employees. And that's, that's, that's your defense against, uh, against one of these, these types of claims. And here's a good one. Can an employee refuse to return to work because they have chosen not to get vaccinated? There's a whole bunch of stuff rolled in there. <laughs> Again, we get into human rights there. So it, it, you'd have to explore why um, they have chosen not to get vaccinated. Uh, if it's a, a human rights issue that's validated and, and can be substantiated by the employee, then you're gonna have to look at accommodation for that employee. But generally, um, if it's just a preference that they not be vaccinated, that's not a reason not to return to work. If they're attempting to access a, a, a creed-based um, uh, objection to, to, to doing this, it has to be a, a genuinely held belief. Uh, and uh, I, I think there was a, a recent case in, in, in BC where, um, where an individual tried to, tried to assert this right, but they basically said, I, I, I don't, um, it, was, it was kind of a, a generalized um, uh, expression of, of, of religion coupled with uh, a, a, an explicitly stated uh, distrust of the government, and they said, uh, "I don't believe what that you know what the government is telling me uh, overrules what uh, what God tells me." And when that was examined, uh, uh, it was uh, uh, it was determined that it wasn't you know quite as uh, legit legitimately held as as a person was uh, was asserting. So it kind of goes back to the other piece. It's the employer's choice about how to accommodate someone who is choosing not to come back to the workplace and one would think that that extends to the situation as well. It definitely does. So there's always two sides of the coin to that. So the, the person would have to establish that there is a legitimate human rights uh, issue there that could be supported by their not return to work. And if they can't substantiate that, then that goes away. But if it is substantiated, then you look at the accommodation part of it. And it would be up to the employer, as I explained before, to decide what that accommodation looks like. Right. There was a fourth question that we talked about, and I know that this was actually a really big issue when the closures started regarding termination or people who are laid off that now may not be recalled. And as a temporary law layoff, they weren't receiving uh, severance pay. But now if they're not called back, is this now considered constructive dismissal? Does it fall under that category? And what, how do employers manage that? Uh, I could imagine you have a position that 
may may be redundant now in this new normal, or at least for the foreseeable future. So what does that look like and what kind of responsibilities does an employer have in that situation? Right, right. so I mean, uh, the laid off employees, if it was for the reason of COVID and, the, and those reasons are specifically set out by legislation, it, it's considered a deemed leave under the infectious disease um, leave. And, and it's retroactive to January 25th. So even though this didn't come out till March of two, uh, 2020, uh, the government made it retroactive to January 25, any employee that was laid off for the reasons of COVID due to, the, due to those reasons. Um, it's a deemed leave under that act rather than the layoff provisions of the uh, Ontario Employment Standards Act. And that was extended now a couple of times and the deadline um, or the, the, the expiry is now July 3, 2021. So employers need to consider now whether they're recalling their employees for after July 3. And if they are, um, they're going to have to get those recall notices out and ask their employees to come back to work um, after the July 3rd expiry date. If they don't recall them, then they are terminated and they're going to have some responsibilities either under the employment contract or under the Employment Standards Act to provide termination and possibly severance pay if that applies. Now, I should, I, I really should um, state also though that. It, the employee could still be uh, on a leave and it could be the infectious disease leave if they qualify under that. So they could re refuse to return to work saying I require this leave or some other leave under the act because they're not accumulative, they are separate. So if some other leave is, is required, uh, the employee um, would have to look at that and uh, and establish whether the employee is entitled to those leaves. And uh, in, under those so circumstances, they would then be on a leave, not a layoff. Well, the dean leave and not a layoff and the layoff provisions of the Employment Standards Act. The other thing that could happen is that rather than recall the employees, if they're not um, ready to get up to biz or you know up to the standard of business they were pre-COVID, they could lay the employee off under the layoff provisions under the Employment Standards Act. So it could be a real layoff and not a deem to leave. However, be careful, employers, because you not a matter of right to lay off your employee. It has to be part. Uh, an express part of an employment contract with your employees, unless you're in some type of seasonal business. So you don't have an automatic right to lay off under the Employment Standards Act, unless you have an express provision in your employment contract with your employees that layoffs are possible. Nick, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. <laughs> um, yeah, that was, that was pretty comprehensive. There's, um, I, I guess, um, there was there was a recent uh, uh, recent legal case as well, which which um, which kind of provided for some of the um, uh, uh, some of the notification, uh, sort sort some of the uh, termination provisions that um, that employees may uh, may be able to avail themselves of uh, if they're deemed to have uh, or if they make it make an assertion that they were able to uh, that they were actually terminated as a result of uh, of this layoff. Um, so there was a, a very recent uh, decision where um, a, a motions judge uh, held that um, with relation to, to, to the infectious disease emergency leave, um, that covers employees uh, with respect to their employment standards um, uh, termination uh, provisions, but it doesn't protect them from any potential common law um, uh, provisions. So even if you're, you're, you're letting someone go, uh, if it's not, or sorry, you're, you're putting someone on, on this leave, uh, on a layoff, even if the, it, uh, unless it's explicitly covered in their employment contract, uh, there's a possibility that, um, well, there's, there's a, you, know, you, you may be held uh, accountable for the common law termination provisions 
um, instead of just the, the, the employment standards uh, for, uh, uh, provisions and common law tends to be quite a bit more than the employment, the SAE yeah, that it is. And a, and a caveat there because employment contracts and termination provisions are, are something that constantly changes within the courts. And right now, uh, the, the courts in the last number of years have been very uh, scrutinized termination provisions uh, quite extensively. Um, and the wording of the termination provisions are, are very important in, in how they're worded as to whether they'll be upheld by a court. And there's many cases where termination provisions are not, especially older termination provisions because they don't meet the standards of today. And, and that's one reason employers really should have their employment agreements um, reviewed once a year and updated. Uh, because if they don't, it will resort to common law. And under common law, as Nick said, it, you, the employee will be entitled to a lot more likely than they would be under um, the Employment Standards Act. Uh, or So it is something to be careful of. It can be very costly to an employer to pay out a terminated employee. And out of curiosity, if there's a severance piece to this, would it date back to the, the original layoff or would it be kind of as of July 3 or how would that look? So a D, any, any layoff or I'm sorry, any leave of absence under the Employment Standards Act counts towards the employee's length of service. So it definitely will affect what they're entitled to under termination um, or severance package. Interesting. And uh, that... Now, there is a question about whether or not those leave provisions might be extended again, because we're still not in a full reopening state. But, uh, and I mean, I think that's what we always hope for, that everything is going to be. And we know that even some of the provisions that the government has given to businesses with regard to CERB and other employment kind of payments, that they'll revisit. We all know that the pandemic may not really end in September. So there is some, some consideration, but what about this situation? It, yeah, it's hard, so it, it's hard to say, sorry, Nick, but it, it is difficult to say because as this pandemic has showed us, uh, legislation is swift and quick and often retroactive. Go ahead, Nick, sorry. <laughs> um, so so the, 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 the just, uh, I think it's actually June June four. So so just very recently, the um, the, the the government has uh, announced that they're going to be extending the um, uh, deemed uh, uh, IDEL through to September the twenty fifth. So like very very current, uh, uh, very 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 recent uh, um, uh, very recent announcement. But Nick, that's not the sorry. Deal. Can you repeat that? Uh, it, it, the infectious disease leave that employees are entitled to is extended, but that doesn't extend your July 3rd deadline for it not to be a layoff or it becomes a layoff rather than a deemed to leave. But as Nick's trying to point out, the employee could still choose to be on an infectious disease leave after July 3rd, because that's now extended to September 25th. You have to remember that the infectious disease leave is a temporary measure imposed for COVID at the moment. It's the only, COVID is the only uh, uh, disease that uh, qualifies under that now. I mean, I think it'll always be there now and they'll, they'll put regulations on to us to maybe another virus of infection that comes in the future that it will cover. But right now it only covers COVID-19 and it's only in place till September. But that doesn't mean that the deemed layoff um, doesn't end on July 3. They become layoffs after July 3. That's uh, all great information. We have about, we have about five minutes left. Um, I don't see any more questions. So I'll ask if anybody does have one, please uh, put it in the chat or the Q&A right away. Uh, we are recording this. I know that Lisa's put that in the chat as well. So we will be making this available if you didn't catch anything, or we'll also provide you with Christina's information and Nick's contact information. So if you have a specific question that they can answer quickly, um, 
I think you're willing to do that. Is that true? Sure. And I wanted to mention that Nick participates in the member to member program. So as a chamber member and you are in need of some HR consulting, Nick does offer chamber members a discount. So uh, you can check that out on valuablechamber.ca in the member to member um, section. So thank you, Nick, and I will meet myself again. Any other thoughts or is there anything that maybe you have that has struck you that we haven't talked about here? Like I said, we try to touch on what those headline making comments would be, but what have you seen more specifically or what has been a recurring theme with the clients that you're helping? Well, I, I think one of the big things is this July 3rd deadline with the, um, this now no, it won't be deemed a, 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 a deemed leave anymore. Um, so that is uh, a lot of questions arise, especially with businesses that aren't prepared to recall all their workers because they're just not up to speed yet. So I, I think that's um, a big issue. I think um, you know the, the issues surrounding vaccinations and no vaccinations and whether they can be mandatory is, is, a, is a big issue. Um, and how they're going to uh, inform their workers. And, and I think it's important to note that the best strategy for employee, uh, work employers through their employees is um, to provide incentives to the employees through these policies rather than prohibit things, uh, provide incentives, incentives to get vaccinated, you know, um, providing, I mean, you're, you're entitled now to time off to get vaccinated but make sure that your policies cover incentives to make sure that employees are continuing to do the uh, health unit advised functions to stop the spread of the virus and, and do it in a positive way, in an informed way, and let the employees know what they are supposed to be doing, what the consequences are if they don't, and make it a positive experience. Nick, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I've seen, um, just to maybe introduce a, a, a completely different topic as well. Um, I've seen a, a few of my clients have uh, noticed that uh, a few of their uh, uh, employees have, have disappeared into the ether uh, through throughout the uh, throughout this, so where they've been they've been laid off and, and they're they're contemplating returning them to uh, to the workplace, they suddenly find that uh, that the, they they're being ghosted by their uh, by their employees, and um, so that's been interesting to to to, to try to uh, to mitigate with them, you know, trying to actively contact them and and uh, and, and move them to a position where they're either you know making a decision to return or or making a decision to uh, to, to leave the workplace. So in that case, if somebody doesn't respond to a recall to work, how long does it take before you can say that they're officially terminated? That there may be policies uh, which address that, um, but I, I would my 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 advice would be to um, to engage with them in, in a deliberate process, um, make it clear you know uh, that you've made multiple attempts to contact them, reference each and every one of those attempts uh, in, in subsequent communications. Um, uh, uh, go so far as to, you know, if, if necessary, um, uh, do registered mail to try and contact people, um, and then um, and then you know make your make your decision based upon that. Um, I wouldn't. I would very strongly hesitate to say that there's a specific time uh, that 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 you would, unless it's spelled out in your policy specifically or collective agreement. Um, but make sure that you've accounted for any possibility that there's an accommodation issue that needs to be uh, considered as well. Um, it, it could be, it could be weeks, it could be, you know, it could even be a month or, or, or more in some circumstances. Right. So would it be advisable also to say in that recall that you identify the date that they need to return? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Absolutely. But, yeah. As Nick said, you would, you would say you're required to return to work on this date, but if there's any reason why you cannot return to work, please contact us, discuss it. So that that's open and, and you're looking to see whether they do have a valid reason and then you would explore that. Right, thanks. 
We're 1057. I don't see any more questions. I hope everybody has felt this was an informative session. It certainly clarifies some things for us. And uh, we'll record it, we'll put it out there. So if there are little bits that people need to catch up on or try and listen to again, that would be, that's going to be great. So we'll put that out there. So thank you again for joining us today. Thanks, Jim. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Bye, everyone. So yeah, thanks you guys, that was great.